A special kind of migrant has been the middleman minority. These include retailers, ranging from pushcart peddlers to international merchants, and money lenders, ranging from pawnbrokers and petty loan sharks to international financiers. Usually, there are far fewer people at the higher levels of all these occupations than at the elementary levels, requiring less money, experience, or sophistication. However, even modest prosperity among middlemen minorities may be resented far more than real opulence among some other groups, such as nobility or entertainers, and those relatively few members of middlemen minorities who achieve genuine wealth tend to be regarded as representative rather than exceptional. In one way or another, middlemen facilitate the movement of goods from the producer to the consumer, without necessarily physically producing anything themselves. Middlemen minorities do this in communities where others are a majority of the population, whether in a particular ethnic enclave or in whole nations. For this to be a viable and lasting role, there must be some cultural difference between the middlemen and those they serve. Otherwise, each community or nation would supply its own middlemen. But however large the role of racial and cultural differences in the histories of middleman minorities, this group of minorities does not represent a particular race or a particular culture. Some are Africans, like the Ibos of Nigeria. Some are Middle Eastern, like the Lebanese and the Armenians. And some are Asians, though different races of Asians, like the overseas Chinese and the overseas Indians. The best known of the middlemen minorities, the Jews, include both European and Middle Eastern peoples. Culturally, these various groups differ from one another in language, food, music, and social customs. Only when cultures are defined more narrowly in terms of work skills and work habits, as well as the fortitude needed to take on the demanding role of middleman minority, do these otherwise disparate groups show similarities. What they have in common is a particular kind of human capital, as economists call the experience and knowledge used in economic activity. Frictions that are all too familiar in intergroup relations tend to become extreme in the case of hostility toward middleman minorities. The word pogrom has often been used to characterize episodes of mob violence and atrocities that broke out against the Jews of Europe at various times in their history. However, the same kind of vindictive terror has been inflicted on other middleman minorities in countries around the world. The Ibos in Nigeria, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, Tamils in Sri Lanka, and Chinese in Southeast Asia have likewise been on the receiving end of such inhuman treatment. In a horrifying contemporary example, a Tamil woman picked at random was dragged off a bus in Sri Lanka, doused with gasoline and set ablaze by a Sinhalese mob in which people danced and clapped their hands while she died in agony. During intergroup violence in Nigeria in 1966, tens of thousands of Ibos were slaughtered indiscriminately by mobs. Back in 1895, Turkish mobs likewise massacred Armenians, including 3,000 men, women, and children who fled to a cathedral for refuge and were burned alive inside when the cathedral was set on fire with 30 cans of petroleum. What all these victims had in common was that they represented middleman minorities in these respective nations. Not all were personally engaged in middleman occupations, but members of the surrounding population were most likely to encounter people of their ethnic group in that role, even if a majority of the Tamils, Igbos, or Armenians worked less conspicuously in other occupations. What is there about middleman minorities that provokes such venomous hostility? Other kinds of racial or ethnic minorities have also faced varying degrees of hostility, whether they were immigrants or descendants of slaves or of conquered indigenous people. Yet none of these other minorities has so often and on such a scale faced lethal mob violence. Tens of thousands of Ibos were slaughtered by their fellow Nigerians, the number of Armenians slaughtered in the Ottoman Empire was more than a million, and Jews on many occasions over the centuries were slaughtered en masse by frenzied mobs in Europe, even before the government-controlled Nazi Holocaust claimed six million Jewish victims. Moreover, middleman minorities have seldom been violent people themselves who might have initiated hostilities. While hatred and even violence against various kinds of minorities have been all too widespread throughout history and in many regions of the world, 
This alone cannot explain the special kind or intensity of hatred and violence directed against middleman minorities. Perhaps what intensifies the feelings against them is that they perform economic functions which have been much misunderstood and condemned throughout history, regardless of who has performed these functions. Moreover, the social isolation of middleman minorities, clannishness is a phrase often used, makes it easy for others to imagine the worst about them and for skilled demagogues to play on that imagination to arouse the public to a frenzy of hatred against them. While his economic functions define the middleman, the middleman minority usually exists where the local population does not provide its own middleman, for one reason or another. It may be simply that such occupations do not attract many people from the local population. Often, however, Local middlemen are simply not able to meet the competition from groups long experienced in such occupations. In Argentina, for example, native Argentine store owners found themselves losing business to Jewish immigrants, charging lower prices and advancing credit to customers who before had to pay cash. Simply imitating the practices of the Jews was much easier said than done. To operate on a thinner profit margin required both finer calculation and a willingness to live on a lower economic level, at least until a large enough clientele could be attracted to offset the lower profit per item by a larger volume of business. Advancing credit also required a shrewd sense of when to lend, to whom, how much, and on what conditions. Here, too, experience was indispensable as well as a close knowledge of local individuals gained by observation and interaction. Groups with generations or centuries of experience as middleman minorities obviously have many advantages in this demanding field, where shrewd understanding, hard work, long hours, and inescapable risks are the norm, and where bankruptcy is seldom far away for those who get careless. While Jews are the most famous of the middleman minorities, so that others are analogized to them, the overseas Chinese as the Jews of Southeast Asia, the Lebanese as the Jews of West Africa, Parsis as the Jews of India, etc. Jews are in fact not the most numerous of the world's middleman minorities, nor are most Jews in such occupations in most countries today. Historically, however, Jews have been disproportionately concentrated in middleman occupations, going back at least as far as the times when Jewish peddlers followed in the wake of the Roman legions, selling to the peoples of the conquered lands. In more recent centuries and more open societies, Jews and other middleman minorities, after securing themselves financially through their earnings from business, have tended to educate their children for the professions. But even before reaching that stage, middleman minorities have often also had skills in various kinds of production, such as shoemaking, textile and clothing manufacturing, gem cutting, or the work of gold or silversmiths. These occupations are not middleman functions as such, though they are functions into which some middlemen have branched out, again the Jews being the most notable example, but by no means the only or most numerous examples. Middleman minorities, such as the Parsis and Marwaris of India, for example, have likewise been prominent in the history of the textile industry in that country, and the Lebanese have maintained an international network of textile dealers centered in Manchester, England. In 18th century Russia, Armenians owned 209 of the 250 cloth factories in the province of Astrakhan. Very similar patterns can be found among the overseas Chinese concentrated in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and other countries of Southeast Asia, but following similar occupational patterns as far away as the Caribbean. They have not only been middlemen in such occupations as retailers and pawnbrokers, but have also branched out to become manufacturers of products ranging from clothing to computers. The overseas Chinese are the largest of the middleman minorities, consisting of about 36 million people scattered around the world, more than twice the entire Jewish population of the world. The overseas Chinese have played a major role in the creation of businesses throughout Southeast Asia and elsewhere, and have played an even larger role in the economies of that region than the Jews have played in the economies of Europe or the Western Hemisphere. It has not been uncommon at various periods of history for the Chinese minority in Southeast Asia only about 10% of the population of that region, to own and operate a majority of the businesses in whole industries in Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, or Indonesia. 
Most of these enterprises have been of modest size and typically family-run operations, but the overseas Chinese dominance is felt as well in large corporations, where even international conglomerates are often family-run. Many other middleman minorities have dominated local commerce in particular regions of the world, such as the Indians and Pakistanis throughout East Africa, the Greeks and Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, Igbos in northern Nigeria, Koreans in black ghettos in the United States, and the Lebanese in numerous countries. Sometimes that dominance continues on into the present day, but in other cases these historical patterns have faded with time or the people themselves have been expelled en masse, a fate all too common in various countries of Europe, Asia, and Africa, for the hostility encountered by middleman minorities has been as striking and widespread as their success in rising from humble beginnings to at least modest prosperity and sometimes real riches for some in their ranks. By the late twentieth century, when Thailand and Indonesia together had five billionaires, all five were overseas Chinese. But seldom have middleman minorities begun their careers in a community or a country by bringing wealth with them. Almost invariably, they have created wealth, both for themselves and for the society around them, often creating not only particular businesses, but in some cases whole industries and functions that did not exist before. Beginning often in poverty, middleman minorities have historically been hawkers and peddlers on a mass scale, for example, Jews in 19th century America and Argentina, and the Lebanese in South Australia, West Africa, and in many parts of the Western Hemisphere. It is from such humble beginnings that there ultimately emerged such businesses as Bloomingdale's, Hagar Slacks, and Levi's. Most peddlers, of course, never reached such economic heights, but many moved up to have their own stores, and some eventually chains of stores. Middleman minorities have typically been urban people, even in agricultural societies. Often, an absolute majority of them living in a given country have concentrated in a single city. Thus, studies during the 1980s showed that most of the Lebanese in France lived in Paris, and most of those in the Ivory Coast lived in Abidjan, while three-quarters of the Lebanese in Australia lived in Sydney. The great majority of the Parsis in India settled in Bombay. Most of the 19th century Jewish immigrants to the United States settled in New York City, while in early 19th century Australia, more than two-thirds of the Jews in the colony of New South Wales lived in Sydney, and in Argentina, most lived in Buenos Aires. Most of the Chinese living in Peru lived in Lima, while most of those in Argentina lived in Buenos Aires. The occupations of middleman minorities may explain their high degree of urbanization, but their high levels of concentration in one or a few cities in each country suggests a social need for contact with compatriots, at least during the early generations of immigration. With the passage of time and the acculturation of later generations to the world of the host society, these concentrations tend to lessen, just as concentration in middleman occupations tends to decrease as later generations go into the professions. In predominantly agricultural societies, middleman minorities have often financed the growing of peasants' crops, as the Chetyars from India once did in Burma, and as the overseas Chinese did in Thailand and Malaysia. Indigenous farmers in East Africa, in what is now Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, were drawn into the world market by people from the Indian subcontinent who lent them money and purchased and marketed their crops. Modern transportation came to much of that region as a result of trucks owned and driven by Indians. Despite these and other contributions of middleman minorities to the societies around them, they have often been seen as mere parasites who play no useful role in the economy. The uselessness of middlemen is a theme found among European colonial rulers in Asia and Africa, among the intellectuals and the ignorant, the religious and the secular. To make money from the mere transference of a physically unchanged product from the producer to the consumer stinks of sorcery to the economically uninitiated, according to F.A. Hayek, and for a moneylender to demand more money back than he lent has been condemned by all three of the great religions that emerged from the Middle East, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Even in the absence of racial or religious differences between middlemen and their customers, Hostility to informal middleman activity arose in a World War II prisoner-of-war camp 
much to the dismay of an economist among the prisoners. Clearly, the middleman could be easily circumvented if all that he did was to insert himself gratuitously between the producer and the ultimate consumer. Producers could simply open their own retail outlets, or consumers could buy directly from the factory. Only where the costs and risks of these alternatives exceed what it would cost to use a middleman is the middleman able to sell and survive. The costs and risks are lower for the middleman simply because he is specialized and experienced in managing inventories, in dealing with customers, and in the other functions he performs. The middleman is also better able to advance credit to many low-income customers, simply because he knows them individually and at closer range than a distant manufacturing corporation or government bureau can. In short, the middleman lowers the costs of economic transactions for all concerned. Otherwise, either the customers or the manufacturers, or probably both, would take their business elsewhere. The belief that middlemen are useless parasites has been tested empirically in different parts of the world and in various periods of history, when governments have expelled some middleman minority en masse. Only after prices and interest rates have risen in the wake of such actions, and in some cases the economy in general has collapsed, has it then become clear just what the middlemen contributed. However, even such painful lessons in economics have not always caused political reevaluations much less reversals of policy, though there have been instances where the expelled middleman minority has later been invited back. But the political embarrassment of such a reversal of policy has often served as a deterrent. Catherine the Great circumvented her own ban on Jews entering Russia by a secret communication to one of her officials in Riga, saying that, in the interests of recruiting some merchant people, passports could be issued without mentioning their nationality or religion. Lest he miss the hint, she added a postscript in German, If you don't understand me, it will not be my fault. In the wake of this communication, Jews began to be recruited. Other middleman minorities are middlemen not only in a purely economic sense, but also in social and political senses. Where a ruling class or race collects money from a large class of poorer people whom they do not wish to deal with directly, Middleman minorities may take on the role of collecting rents or feudal dues for landlords or taxes for government, all roles virtually guaranteeing unpopularity. Even in a modern capitalist economy, an imperial race may prefer having someone else deal directly with foreign peoples whose languages and customs they are unfamiliar with, or whom they may find distasteful, or who simply do not seem worth the trouble of investing time and energy in getting to understand. Thus, the British East India Company dealt with the people of Bombay through Parsis as intermediaries in both tax collection and local marketing. Large European commercial firms in West Africa often used Lebanese traders as intermediaries in dealing with the native peoples, just as they used Indian traders as intermediaries in East Africa. On a more mundane level, middleman minorities have often been cultural intermediaries, facilitating economic transactions between individual members of other groups whose cultural differences made such transactions difficult to arrange. A 19th century example from Eastern Europe may be illustrative. A Ruthenian man was asked what he would charge to shingle a roof, but failed to respond. He was dismayed at the idea of undertaking such a contract and refused to make any estimate. A Jew was then given the contract and he came to the same man and offered him a fixed sum, which was accepted, for shingles and shingling, making, of course, his own profit on the business. Here, the Jewish contractor played a role familiar to middleman minorities around the world, serving as a cultural intermediary to get things done, which were mutually beneficial to parties who were prevented by cultural barriers from making the same transaction themselves. Often such middlemen are blamed for exploitation, but the more fundamental problem is that the other transactors are in different cultural universes. The story of middleman minorities is not just an economic story. It is a social and political story as well. The racial, religious, linguistic, and other differences among the middleman minorities of the world makes the prevalence of a general social and political pattern in their relations with those around them all the more striking. The special hatred directed at middleman minorities has chilling implications that reach well beyond racial and cultural issues.
that people who have created much of the economic progress of a community or a society should be hated by those who have been the passive beneficiaries of that progress says something about the irrational side of human beings in general, and in particular their susceptibility to manipulation by skilled demagogues. However vicious the attacks on middleman minorities, those attacks seldom arise spontaneously. Such groups often live at peace with the surrounding society for generations, or even centuries, until some special events or movements come along to make them targets. Very often, the instigators of such disorders are business competitors, though sometimes they are simply political demagogues advancing their own careers, whether on the petty scale of community leaders who incite American blacks against Korean or Vietnamese store owners in ghetto neighborhoods, or, at a national level, dictators like Idi Amin in Uganda or Hitler in Nazi Germany.